I'll give you a second to <laughs> finish reading this talk. I don't know whether everyone can see it, but hopefully you can. <laughs> Uh, okay. Good evening, everyone. My name's Ray. Oops. Um, I'm a senior data scientist working for a fintech company. Um, building ML products in a complex and really dynamic domain like fraud is really frustrating and satisfying all at the same time. So for this talk, I will show you some of the complexities in building ML products. Um, in fraud detection. In particular, this talk focuses on the question, what is true and how do we measure it? Let's start by building a little bit of context first. Where does the fraud come from? Well, the first category is just stolen card, you know, credit card, debit card, bank account. Maybe most of you would have the uh, experience of seeing unauthorized charge on your uh, bill statement, and then you're like, where does this charge come from? Uh, maybe some people would raise their hand and say like, oh yeah, it's from my spouse and children. I'm not talking about those chargebacks. I'm talking about chargers for like transactions who are truly not authorized by you or any of one of your family members. So the second category would be account takeover. Essentially, hackers just hack into your account and then basically take all of the information that's there. The third category is social engineering. So most of people probably have heard of all the scam schemes out there, and probably a lot of you receive tons of e emails or like text messages every day to even you know deal with the scammers. Okay, now that we understand all of the problem domain. Let's take a quick look at the typical ML flow. So usually what people do um, is just take tons of raw data. Uh, that includes both the labels and features if you're doing the supervised machine learning. And then try to get sift through the data and get the high quality labels and features. And then the data is ready for modeling. And what you do next is to partition the data into training data, which is to, you know, models, you can have many candidates of models, and then you would have the validation data, which is used to select the best models among all of your candidates. And the last one, you would have the test data, which is to truly measure how is your best model doing, uh, potentially in real world. The goal of an ML model in fraud detection is to estimate the probability of transaction being fraudulent. And so whenever I use the word model performance, it refers to how accurate the estimate is. So let's narrow down our topic uh, in the beginning of this talk. What is the true model performance and how do we measure it in fraud? Um, and I just want to iterate on a few things. First of all, the label right now here is whether a transaction is fraudulent or not. Um, and the goal is to estimate the probability of a transaction being fraudulent. Now, I would like to draw your attention to the test data and how we um, measuring the model performance is really difficult there. Please raise your hand if you care about truth. Okay, I guess nobody dares not to raise their hand. Okay, there are, <laughs> there are people who are like shaking their hand. Okay, honestly, if you don't care about truth and if you can still keep your job, kudos to you. <laughs> um, I don't know why you're, you care about truth, but I care about it. Because to make progress, a feedback look that reflects re reality is just critical. Um, I don't know how you get around it. So in the context of building ML products for fraud detection, the truth here refers to the model performance. So hopefully right now I have given you enough context and I'm going to start spelling out all the fun complexities that obstruct our view of the truth. Complexity number one, 
rushers evolve super quickly. For any ML solutions, testing data doesn't reflect all the possible cases that could happen in real world because the world is fundamentally changing and shifting all the time. However, this is a particularly thorny problem in fraud detection space because it is rosters jobs to constantly find the loopholes of the model or your system or anything that you build. So maybe a week ago, a fraudulent transaction might look like the red dot uh, on the graph, but a week later, those fraudulent transactions quickly morph into some other op shape that you don't know how to really capture them. Complexity number two, it takes about two to five weeks for fraudulent trans transactions to show up on any FinTech platform's ledger. Why this is the case? Um, well, if you think about it, at least this is the case for me, I don't check my bill statement every day. I check maybe every month. And so by the time I realize there is an authorized transaction on my account, a few weeks already passed. So I have to report to the bank like, hey, you need to reimburse me because this is not authorized transaction. Complexity number three, what is even considered fraud? So from afar, all of the fraudulent transactions look like the same. But if you really zoom in to the shape of different risky transactions, you would realize, hey, there is actually a lot more nuance that we need to tease out and understand here. So the first case would be promotion of use. Let's say a transaction never turned out to be fraudulent, but the intent of the user is to get as much referral bonus from the business as possible. So even though the transaction itself is not problematic, it's still risky transactions. It's still some, it's still causing the business some sort of financial loss. Um, another example, service dispute. So for example, if you buy a product, let's say you didn't receive the product, then you can file a claim to be like, hey, you need to give me, give me the money back because I didn't receive the product. In that case, it's shown up on the company ledger as this is a fraudulent, this is a loss, but it is not really a fraudulent loss. Um, but however, for example, if you pay for the product and you get the product, but you still file a claim saying that the service provider didn't give you the product, then you are a fraudulent uh, a customer, but it's really difficult to figure out which customer you are in real world. Lastly, in fraud, whatever intentions that the system puts out there will end up reflecting in the collected data. It is a loopy system. This is a big contrast to many predictions tasks out there. So for example, if you're predicting whether there will be an earthquake or not, well, upon prediction, your intervention will be, hey, people get out of this building. But this will not impact whether there will be an earthquake or not. But upon fraud detection prediction, you're gonna do something to the system to intervene the behaviors that you're seeing in your data, and then fraudsters would quickly respond to whatever you right now putting out there. And then the whole data starts to shift in. So quickly, your data becomes obsolete, even though you think that you have your true data. And so all of these complexities together, they interact with each other, they are slightly different, um, and they would pose difficult questions. So when business asks me, how is the model doing in the last four weeks? I don't know. We're seeing an increasing number of transactions that got flagged as high risk. Is the model gone crazy? I have no idea. To productionize this new model, it will take quite a bit of time and effort. Are you sure the new model will actually outperform the existing model? I can give you some guess on maybe, probably, but I cannot never guarantee that's the case. Due to time limitation, I will just quickly go over some principles that I rely on to deal with this complexity in building ML products for fraud detection. Well, first of all, we'll just have to accept the reality. Like, nobody will ever probably get hold of the true truth. It's kind of a fun phrase. Um, and also, we have to be comfortable with uncertainty and acknowledge the existence of all of those complexities. And then the second part is that just don't give up fighting against the entropy. 
because there's a lot of nuance that you can tease out more than you think you can, and then start building solutions around it. The last one is that invite the business experts to build the dream data together. As a data scientist, as someone building ML products, my dream is always a very ideal set of data that you can never obtain in real life, but you can get closer to that if you have a really proper data, good data management system alongside the business stakeholders who have the most information about your business and product. That's it.